Oh, do you believe what that last song says? You're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. Do you believe that? If you had to go without anybody else and just you and Jesus, do you believe you could have a life that was abundant and full and complete? That's hard for us. You know, you're all saying, yes, yes, of course, because you know you're supposed to say that. <clears throat> but do we act that way? We generally act like... Um, <clears throat> If I have to give up Jesus to have that other person, I'll happily do it. That seems to be generally the way we act. You know, so it's interesting, we sing songs like that. I've been preaching the last couple of weeks on, is God enough? And uh, I think it's a continuing question we have to face. Do we actually believe that we would have all we wanted and needed if it was just you and God. Father God, as we open your word today, would you come and teach us once again, I pray. Amen. So, the last few weeks we've been looking at the fact that we are created in the image of God, not the image of beast we are a special creation after God was through creating the animals he was done it was good it was finished then he created human beings in his image to be his friends not his pets we're made in paradise and for paradise not for an evolutionary cycle of brutality struggle and death we were made in plenty not in a heartless struggle for survival at the elimination of all competitors. Our hearts are made for security and freedom, innocency and innocence, abundance and beauty, comfort and joy, all of which is wrapped up in the word love. When God made Adam, it was just he and Adam. It wasn't Adam that said it's not good for me to be alone. It was God who said it's not good for Adam to be alone. Now what do we do with that? When you think of something nowadays that's not good, then what is it? Bad? I came up with some synonyms here. When we think of not good, we think of bad, wrong, broken, damaged, defective, impaired, flawed, blemished, tainted, marred, haywire, I like that one, disfigured, perverse, aberrant, deviant, corrupt, spoiled, rotten, awry, amiss, unkind, or unhappy. That's what not good is. Right? But when God said it's not good that Adam should be alone, there was no bad, wrong, broken, damaged. I could go through the whole list again. It, everything was perfect. How can you have something not good when everything's perfect? See, we only think of not good as in terms of being bad. It was bad for Adam to be alone. No. There was nothing bad in, in the world. It was all good, very good. And yet it was not good. Wrap your brain around that. The point is, before sin came in, when it says it's not good, it doesn't mean it was bad, wrong, or broken. It just means God wasn't done yet. He had something to add to paradise. Now, if he hadn't have added Eve to paradise, paradise would have still been paradise. It would have been perfect. It would have been complete. It would have been whole. And Adam would have had a happy, full life forever and ever, amen, with God. But God knew he had more for paradise, right? So it's very important that we don't get the idea that somehow life was incomplete and paradise wouldn't have been paradise before Eve was, was created. 
It just means God wasn't done yet. You see, God can improve on paradise. I want you to think about that. Throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, we have this, these pictures that we are forever and ever, amen, going to be walking around heaven in white robes with a little golden band around our forehead and petting animals. Amen. A day at the zoo with Jesus. <laughs> now, how many eons into eternity is it going to take for us to get just a little bored? Like, can we do something different tomorrow? The reality is, we again, we have this idea that if it's not good, it must be bad. But in God's eternity, there will be no bad. We also have the idea that if it's, if it's perfect, it must be static. Think that through. If something is perfect, it is just the way it's supposed to be, right? And perfect kind of means static, complete. It's not going to change because it's perfect. Because the only way we know to, to, to get something perfect is to take it from imperfect to perfect, and then it's done, and that's it. But I believe we're going to live in a perfect universe forever and ever where God will be constantly improving on perfection without having it been less perfect the day before. You get what we're saying here? I believe eternity with God in a perfect universe will be dynamic. He'll always have a new adventure, a new surprise, a new joy something to look forward to tomorrow even though we have everything today now that's impossible for us to understand because we live and think in the finite and the fallen finite God works in the infinite I do not believe eternity is going to be boring I don't believe we'll finally get to the point where we've done it all and we're just having to do it again forever and ever. Amen. I mean, you think about living forever and ever, no matter how we slice it here, eventually that would get boring. But not with a perfect God in a perfect universe where when everything is perfect and complete today, he's got something even better tomorrow without it having been worse yesterday. Does that make sense? You got to kind of stretch your brain just a little bit there. But that, that concept I want to take back to before sin, when God said it's not good for Adam to be alone, it wasn't bad, it wasn't imperfect, it wasn't uh, broken, it wasn't deficient in any way. And if Adam had never had Eve come along, he never would have known there were more joys than the joys he already had. And if you're full of joy already, you're not going around saying, well, I wonder if I'm missing a joy somewhere. You're just full of joy. You know, we got a real problem in the modern generation of young men. There's a lot of young men out there, some who have even been willing to admit that they're afraid to commit to a young lady they're in love with today because they're afraid if they commit today, somebody better might come along tomorrow. That is a sick viewpoint. Sorry. Because that's not how love works. Love doesn't happen by waiting for the next best thing to come along. Love happens by making a commitment to someone and spending your life in love with them to boo with who comes along next. That shows a real twist in the psyche. But we have this idea again that perfect is kind of done and static. That's it forever and ever. No. 
not in God's perfect universe. He can improve on paradise every day. A new experience, a new adventure. Not from imperfect to perfect, but from perfect to perfecter. And when he says it was not good that Adam should be alone, there was nothing bad or incomplete. And it, he's just saying, I have got more joy. And if he hadn't have brought the more joy in, there wouldn't have been less joy or a joyless life. Adam would have been perfectly fine, but God knew he had more. So he sends him to name the animals, and Adam discovers there's always a complementary pair. And he doesn't have an Azer Kenegdo. He doesn't have a helper um, corresponding to himself. God lets a desire come up. And then he puts Adam to sleep. And then he splits him in half. He takes a, a side of Adam. So he left one side and he took the other side. So now you have two sides. The word rib is never used anywhere else in the Bible for an anatomical part. It's always used for two sides of something. Two sides of the sanctuary. Two sides of the ark. Two sides of the hill. Somebody said last week, but it says rib. They put a little emphasis into it. It wasn't any of you. <laughs> yeah, but that's Hebrew, and that's the way it got translated. Took a side. Now, which side came first? <laughs> right? If you cut a rock in half, which side came first? Both. Okay? And out of one side, he completed Adam, and the other side, it says he built... A woman. And then he brought her to the other side that he'd made into the man. I believe at least that's the point where sexual differentiation comes. Before there was no complementary opposite fit together. Now God cuts Adam in half and he makes both halves into holes that are slightly different but only fit with each other. And he must have spent some time with Eve. He made her, because then it says he brought her to the Adam. So she wasn't made by Adam. Over here somewhere, behind a tree, over the hill or something. And then God, so God spent time with Adam. And he split Adam in half. Then he spent time with Eve. And then he brought them together. Humanity is not from two different stocks, a female stock and a male stock that got together. Humanity has a common origin. God made an Adam. Then he split the Adam into Adam and Eve. And then he brings us back together. There's only one race, one human race. Both complete. We've talked about this. We do not come together to complete ourselves. I'm incomplete without you. I'm nothing without you. All the love songs are baloney. Sorry about that. They're very romantic, but they don't work that way. If you're a half needing the other half to make a whole, God says the two will become one. The only way the two become one is if you do multiplication. One times one equals one. So if you're a half and you come together with another half to be made whole, a half times a half is what? A quarter, and have any of you discovered that in relationships? You come together because you want to be, yeah, you're just incomplete without that other person, and yet when you get with that other person, you just drain each other dry, and the whole thing goes down the drain. God intends that we be whole and complete in Him, and when two wholes come together, you have an uh, overflowing abundance. Now you have joy and love flowing out of your coming together to others, to children, and on. It's very important that before we try to come together with another person, we become complete ourselves in God. We're back to, is God enough? We technically, and I don't think any of us did it, including me before I got married, but now in my old age, I recognize that technically we need to come to the point where we would be perfectly happy 
us and God forever. Now we're ready for another person. That's pretty heavy stuff. It's an ideal that's way, way up there. But I believe if two people who are complete in God truly come together, the marriage will never fail. And when Adam saw Eve, he began to write poetry. All right, turn in your Bibles now, chapter 2. Adam said, now this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. I had a slide for this, but I completely forgot to put it in, so you're going to have to go without slides today. The woman's name, the word for woman is Isha. I-S-H is the first syllable, and S-H-A-H is the second syllable. The S-H is a single letter in the Hebrew, and it's doubled. Isha. I want you to get a sense of names here. Go back to Genesis 1, verse 27. God created Adam, that's the word for man there, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The word male there is the word zakar, Z-A-K-A-R. It's used for the male half of humans, animals, all through Scripture. And the word for female is nekebah. It's used, again, for human females, animal females. Zakar and nekebah. The next time those words are actually used is in chapter 5. And verse 2, where it almost repeats 127. And he created them, zakar and nekebah, and blessed them and called them Adam. Okay? Now, when you get down to ch every use of the word man or Adam throughout all of chapter 1 and 2 until you get to verse 23 is the word Adam. So if it says man, it's Adam. Most of the time, it actually has the definite article. 126, God said, let us, said, let us make Adam in our image. Verse 127, God created the Adam in his own image, Zakar and Nekebah, male and female. 2 verse 5, there was no Adam to till the ground. 2 verse 7, God formed Adam of the dust of the ground, and Adam became a living being, or the Adam of the dust of the ground, and the Adam became a living being. Verse 8, um, God planted a garden, and there he put the Adam that he had formed. 2 verse 15, God took the Adam and put him in the garden. 2 verse 16, God commanded the Adam about the two trees. Verse 18, God said it's not good for the Adam to be alone. Verse 19, God brought all the animals to the Adam and whatever the Adam called them, each living creature, that was its name. Notice Adam gave the animals, the other creatures, their name. Verse 20, the Adam gave names to all the livestock and the birds, but for Adam there was not found an Isaiah Conegdo, a helper comparable. Verse 21, so God caused the deep sleep to fall on the Adam. God took one side, made Eve. Other side was Adam, brought him back together. Verse 22, from the side God had taken from the Adam, he made an Isha, a woman. Now, all through Scripture, that is now going to be the primary word used for woman and wife. When it says he took a wife, it literally says he took a woman. Okay? There's really not a separate word used much for wife. It's generally just woman. What makes you a wife is if you're his woman. <laughs> and then they'll translate it his wife. Um, verse 23. Then the Adam, when he saw the Isha, the Adam... said... This is at last bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. There's something in there. Some translations show it and some don't. It does say this is finally or at last. You almost get the picture that once Adam perceived with his scientific mind that there were two, 
of every other animal that were the same opposites, complementary pair, it struck him that maybe there was one for him. And he goes looking. But every other animal belongs with a different pair. There are no extras, there are no unattached, and there are none like him. And when he takes his little nap and wakes up, He says at last, there she is. It's interesting. I actually think God had him name the animals to kind of bring up a longing. Yeah, he's totally happy, totally full of joy. Life is complete. He can't imagine anything else. And then he sees all the pairs of animals and he starts imagining something. We men have been imagining ever since. And he wakes up, and he's not half the man he used to be, right? Something's <laughs> missing, and yet he's whole, he's complete. But now there's that desire. And then she walks into the room. And he says, at last, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha. Notice, he gives her her name. For she was taken out of man. Now that man is not Adam. That man is now Ish. Ish and Isha. Now there are those in the Hebrew scholarship world that say Ish and Isha are related words. One is just the feminine form of the other. Ish is the masculine form, Isha is the female form. There are others who say the names have no etymological uh, connection. You know what etymological is? Linguistic background. For instance, male and female. Doesn't it sound like those words have a similar etymological background? They are entirely and totally unrelated. Did you know that? I've got the data right here, if I can find it. Male comes from the Latin mas, which became masculus. Are you masculus? Female came from femina, which has no relationship to mas. And yet it became female kind of due to its association over time with the word male. So there the fact that the words sound the same or like they come from the same root is only because of modern usage, not because of etymological origin. You got that? So there are those who say that um, Ish and Isha are related. There are those who say based on the spelling, because ish is not really I-S-H, it's I-Y-S-H. Every Hebrew word has a three consonant root. So I-S-H, sorry folks, is not three consonants because S-H is one letter in the Hebrew, okay? So I-Y-Sh. <laughs> those are the three consonants in the guy's name, in the male. And the woman is I, S, H, which is one letter, gets doubled, but it's still one, and then H at the end, so it's I, S, H, H. Now, some fancy Hebrew scholar several hundred years ago rather mystically said, well, if you drop the Y from Ish and you drop the H from Isha, you have the same root, and in the Hebrew, the vowel can change. It's the consonants that matter, and when the vowel gets changed to E, esh is the word for fire. So you have fire and fire. And what draws them together? The Y dropped out and the H dropped out, and they form the shortened word Yah, which is the shortened word for God. He brings the fires together. Isn't that nice? Now that's kind of the... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? I want to say spacey, but um, um, 
Oh, come on, there's a word. Okay, I'll get it one of these days. The Kabbalah deals with the... Uh, that, the word's gone. The word's completely gone. If I come up with it, I'll tell you later. Mystic, thank you. I just saw it right there. It's the mystic way of looking at it. I'm not sure there's any great truth in that, that we are fire and fire and brought together by Yah. So I don't know which is true. I looked online. Are the two words related? Male and female form of the same word, Isha and Isha, or are they two separate ones? I don't know. I kind of, I go with related. I think it makes sense. He says, this is Isha. She was made out of Ish. Now, I don't know why I gave you all those words, but I thought you'd be interested. Verse 24. Therefore, Ish, a man, see, the way it's translated in the Bible, you can't tell if that's going to be Adam or going to be Ish. Therefore, E shall leave his Ab and his M, his father and his mother, his dad and his mom, and hold fast to his Isha. Your Bible will say wife, but it's just the word woman in the previous verse. And they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked. The man, which is it, Adam or Isha, or Ish? Adam or Ish? You don't know. That happens to be Adam this time. Adam and his Isha were both naked and were not ashamed. One thing is clear. We have a common ancestry. God made one human stock. He split it, brought it back together, and we're all from that one human stock. Men are not from Mars and women from Venus. We're all from the same stock. We were made to complement, not butt heads, not conflict. Secondly, I believe that we are equal as human beings because there is no pecking order, there's no hierarchy before sin. They were both given dominion over the rest of creation. And if you split Adam in half, which half came first? Common origin, equal partners, complementary, whole human beings, complete when separate, completer together without being less complete apart. We do not come together to complete each other. We come together to complement each other. We don't come together to find joy. We come together to overflow with joy. We don't come together to find happiness. We come together to share happiness. We should not start relationships from a deficit position, but from a whole position. And that's one of the reasons I think we have so much trouble with our relationships working, is we start from a deficit and we're still looking for wholeness, and another human being cannot make you whole. Only God is enough to do that. That's how God made it in paradise. It was good. It was very good. Complete, full, excellent and from a human standpoint, unimprovable. And then the point I've been making from this is, should we not, those of us who are seeking to live God's life, even in a fallen world, should we not be seeking to let God restore the original in us as much as possible? Should not the people of God truly be able to walk as one family without hierarchical leadership, male over female or one dominant over others, all lifting, loving. It's God is a bottom-up God. If we're all serving one another and loving one another, leadership becomes he who, as Jesus said, who is the leader will be the servant of all. There's no domination we're given dominion over the world, but there should be no dominion over one another. Should we not be seeking to come back to what God wanted rather than trying to institutionalize patriarchy or matriarchy in our midst? So studying Torah, what is Torah? Somebody said to me last week again, I don't have a clue what Torah is. They hadn't been here. 
for weeks and weeks. And what is Torah? It's the Hebrew word for law. Anytime you read the word law, most of the time, I shouldn't say anytime, most of the time, you know, meditate on his law day and night. David is saying, I meditate on his Torah. And technically, that's the first five books of the Bible. So if we're reading what the Bible says, the Word of God, and we're seeking to follow it, it's not about trying to be good enough to earn God's love or favor. When we try to live by God's social and moral principles, we're not trying to be good enough to be saved and get to heaven. It's not about avoiding the wrath of God in hell. It's not about not being bad. It's about seeking to live paradise even in the parking lot. God's beautiful paradise has been paved over. We're born in the parking lot. But God says, if you follow my ways, here's how you can live paradise in a lost world. Why? So we can find life. God wants to give us life. And secondly, so we can live it and others can see it because we live in a world that says it never existed, it does not exist, and it never will exist, and it can't happen. And when the church causes it to happen, the world will beat a path to our door when they see love truly working. All right. We've been circling. I brought a couple new things in today. We're going to move forward now. Chapter 3. Something happened in paradise that was definitely not good. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the Isha, the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Or the old King James says, yea, has God said. And one Hebrew scholar that I knew, knew now deceased, he felt that the Hebrew word translated there indeed or yea would probably be best translated huh. <laughs> Have you ever met somebody and, and you thought they were really nice and then you told a friend, hey, I just met so-and-so and I really think they're nice and they go, huh. <laughs> what happens to your thinking? You just immediately begin thinking, oh, there must be something wrong with them. Right? And the, and the serpent says, huh, has God said you can't eat of all the trees of the garden? Insinuating, he gave all this stuff and then he says, don't touch. Which the serpent is insinuating that Eve may not be as perfectly happy as she thinks she is. And all it takes is a huh. And we begin to wonder, what am I missing? Right? I mean, you think about this. Usually we will tend to say, you know, if, if enough people make an accusation, there must be some truth in it. And yet Satan in heaven originally convinced a third of the hundreds of millions of angels that they were not as happy as they could be when there was nothing to be unhappy about. You think about it. The presence of an accusation does not infer that there's a problem. Otherwise, there's a problem with God. And God says, no, I'm not the problem. Lucifer says, yes, you are. If you'll make me God, I'll straighten this thing out. I'll... I'll, I'll if you put me in charge, I will be like the Most High. I can improve on paradise. That's what he's saying. If you'll follow me and not God, you can be happier. You mean I'm not happy now? And somehow he convinced a third of the angels that were perfectly happy that they weren't perfectly happy when there really was nothing wrong. And he's doing exactly the same thing here to Eve. There was nothing wrong. There was nothing missing. They had plenty of everything. Life was perfect and beautiful and wonderful. And he goes, huh. And the woman said, we can eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, just not the one you're in. Yeah, God's given abundance. He's only restricted one tree, the one you're in. He says if we eat of that one or touch it, we will die. Well, now the serpent was both touching and I'm sure munching. And the serpent was talking 
which gives the impression that if you eat of this fruit, you can have powers you didn't have before. And the serpent said, you will not surely die. Now God had said over in chapter 2, verse 17, the day that you eat of this fruit, Adam, you will surely die. Literally, dying, you will die. The, the word is there twice, dying, you will die. It's a Hebrew idiom. It's used in other words in other places, and it seems to put emphasis. But literally, dying, you will die. It's very interesting that when the serpent in verse 4 says, you will not surely die, he quotes exactly and puts a knot in between. Dying, you will not die. He didn't say you won't die. But he said, in dying, you won't end up dead. Instead, God knows that you'll really become more like him, knowing good and evil. So he insinuates here that there's more life to be had outside the restrictions that God has evidently placed, and that if they will go outside of that, yes, they'll experience a thing called dying, but God's been lying to you because dying is not an end. Dying is a continuation at a higher level of existence. And that has been the devil's lie ever since about death. Just about everybody on planet Earth believes that dying takes you to a higher level, higher, higher level of existence. But the bottom line here is just as the serpent said in paradise, follow me and I will improve on paradise. He told Eve, follow me and we can improve on paradise. Now, I'd like to suggest that at the beginning of this sermon, I said God can improve on paradise. When he said it's not good for Adam to be alone, he wasn't saying anything was bad or wrong. He was perfectly good, but he wasn't done. God can improve on paradise, and he will improve on paradise throughout eternity without there having been anything wrong before he improved it. But what happens when creatures try to improve on paradise? That's pretty arrogant, isn't it? I'm going to improve on what God did. And yet, essentially, that's all sin is. Sin is not necessarily doing something bad. Sin is trying to improve on what God has already done and says is good and is complete. And sin is trying to improve on paradise. Sin is not necessarily doing something bad, but the problem is when we try to improve on paradise, all we do is break something. Because we're creatures, not creators. We can't improve on paradise. Now, do you get the ramifications here? All sin is is Satan coming along and offering an alternate lifestyle to the one God designed. And all we've been doing ever since in sin is still believing that if we follow what God designed the way God designed it, we won't really find life. We have to improve on it. We have to go to some alternate of what God designed, and only in allowing or doing this alternate will we find life and happiness and fullness. And that's built on the basic premise that God is not enough. And we don't trust that what he gave will truly fill us up and make us happy. Give us life. And so we have to create alternative lifestyles to the one God designed and devised for us. Do you understand why Paul can say in Romans 14, 23, whatever is not of faith is sin? Because that's the bottom line of all sin. I choose to distrust that God's life for me is enough. Now, once we launch out into all the alternate lifestyles of sin, Now in the Torah, God begins to say, don't do this, don't do that, that will not lead to life. The problem is that's usually one of our alternates. And 
now the world thinks that following Torah is to be discriminatory and bigoted and a non-free thinker and not find life. And what do we believe as followers of God? If we put our trust in God, we've put our trust in that his original devising of lifestyle for us is the best. Nothing that we can do can improve on it. And yet that goes counter to what our, our natural, uh, some of our sinful desires, what our society says. This is totally counterintuitive to everything around us today that we see in the media and, and, and in, in life and, and, and just in society in general. Says living by God's devised plan of life will not fulfill your needs. You have to adopt an alternate. Now you can take that and go anywhere you want to. There are certain things in our world that are called alternate lifestyles. I'm not talking just about that, but I would be talking about that. I'm talking about anything, any living. Control freaks? It's just an alternate lifestyle. The world would be great if I were in charge. Right? That's an alternate lifestyle. Gathering of wealth, power, fame. Everything is get me up here in one way or another. Or sexual issues, sexual deviancy, whatever. Um, going at life any other way than the way God designed it is trying to improve on paradise. And have you begun to discover that all you end up doing is breaking something? Usually your own heart. Does that make sense? So after Adam and Eve ate of the tree, it says the woman saw the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. Are you going to have a question for Eve in heaven? You put us in this mess just because it looked good. <laughs> it was pretty. trying to improve on paradise. Why have we taken all this time to talk about paradise? Because I think we need a bit of a vision of what God has. What he designed. So that we could ask the question, do we believe God's paradise is enough. Do we believe that if we follow the do's and don'ts of Torah, of his law, obedience, the very word obedience sounds constricting, doesn't it? Yet the Bible says don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our minds need to look at obedience in a whole different way. Because obedience to God is not restrictive, it's transforming. I find it so interesting. To be a free thinker means you can think of anything as long as it does not involve God. Right? Atheists are free thinkers. Free thinkers society believe God is bunk. If you believe in God, you're not a free thinker. That's interesting. So a free thinker cannot add the supernatural to their dimension of thinking. But the confined thinker can. Isn't it interesting how language turns things upside down? Those who call good evil and evil good, white, black, and black, white, yes, no, and no, yes. We're the free thinkers. We have the freedom to consider there's more going on than meets the eye. 
And we have the freedom to realize that obedience is transformational, not constrictional. And that by not doing the things Torah says not to do, we're not diminishing our life, we're actually letting go of stuff we thought would make us happy that's only eventually going to break our hearts. And although it may feel like we're letting something go now, God has never said no to something that would improve your life. We do not have the capacity to improve on paradise. God made paradise. We paved it over. God says, follow my rules and it will set you free to find life that won't bite you in the backside and break your heart in the end. It will be the slow approach. Not instant gratification. That will get you in trouble every time. Our feelings are skewed. Our feelings will take us into the ditch. How many times have your feelings ended you up in the ditch? It was an exquisite falling into the ditch, but the bottom hit just as hard. The fall was fun, but the bottom came up really fast. But if we go for the ultimate, and we're willing to deny the immediate desire when God says, no, that will not bring happiness, that will not bring life. It'll bring a thrill, but it'll break your heart. If we're willing to go for the big, go for the long haul, God says, you will find life in a fallen world. You'll find life abundantly. I have come to give you life and to give it to you. God can improve paradise and he will be improving paradise for eternity. We cannot improve paradise. We only break things. Sin is not doing bad things. But sin will have you end up doing bad things to yourself and others. Because every time we try to improve paradise, we just end up breaking something or someone. God, as we look at these things we need our thinking transformed the world wants to conform our thinking to the idea that you are not enough your ways are not enough trusting you will limit us and constrict us but you created paradise and you want to set us free to live paradise even in a fallen world to start living now what we will live for eternity. To go for the real thing instead of the fake that breaks our hearts. Lord, may we come to see obedience as freedom. Because obedience to you is the door to paradise. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen.